Welcome to another in the SANS Incident Commander series. I'm your host, Steve Armstrong Godwin, and in this one, we're going to look at how accurate is your recovery timeline. And why does it actually matter? Well, I'll tell you the reason why. When I look at a lot of organizations, when they publish the fact that they've got network issues, especially when I see it's the CISO telling us about network issues and not the CTO, the technology officer, I'm always suspicious. And this is because uh, Giving them their fair dues, a lot of times you will want to investigate any major outage, certainly if it's affecting production systems, to see if there's a security impact. Sadly, for a lot of these organizations, that security impact is revealed as they identify a whole series of encrypted or damaged or deleted machines as actioned and impacted by an attacker. The next thing they turn around and say is, well, let's just get those systems spun back up again. Let's get this system operational and let's get our customers back using our services again. Then they turn to the admins who say, we're not doing this in a few hours. And sadly, I've been in several cases where the, uh, the first time that the execs find out that the recovery plan isn't measured in hours and days, it's measured in days and weeks, that's a really bad position to be in because what do you do if you're offline for three weeks? Can you afford to be offline for three weeks? Will you have any customers available when you finally come back online in three weeks? And do you even know what that timeline looks like? Because if you don't know the timeline, all of your communications to your customers are pretty much like making it up. And that's never a good basis for any communications with your customer. So the execs will turn around and go, hang on, hang on, where's the business continuity team? Where's the disaster recovery team here? You've been doing tests. You've done, you've done system outages. You've got domain controller outages. You've done data center outages. You've done link outages. You've done all these tests. Why does this not work? And that's because they were simply that, tests. And when you're doing a disaster recovery test, a lot of times you're very careful to not impact operations. And therefore you plan and you control every aspect of that to make sure when that, that data center or that site or that server or that link goes down, that you don't affect operations. That's like a, that's like a pen test, disaster recovery pen test, planned and scoped. Really, when you're looking at an incident, it's more like a red team disaster recovery. And there you're looking at the fact that also you don't know what's been impacted. It wasn't planned. Things weren't taken down in the right order. And maybe the very systems that you need to get access to get in to assess the damage before you even do the recovery, those systems themselves are not available. And this is when you get into that argument then that, you know, you told us you could restore these systems and the backup admins are like, yeah, we can restore systems. You told us it'd be a matter of minutes to restore systems. Yeah, it is a matter of minutes to restore systems or a system, but not to recover all of the systems and not to plan that, that, that gradual reintroduction of systems and not to, to make sure that those systems are available in the right priority order. That's a whole different kettle of fish, which a lot of times hasn't been considered or certainly not planned. Then you get the other problem is whilst you know, the sysadmins may turn and say, look, you know, the backups are gone. Maybe they've been impacted by the attacker or maybe they've just been corrupted. Or maybe there's no connection between the backup systems and where they operationally need to connect to. So they may turn and say, well, let's rebuild from scratch. So they go and rebuild from scratch. But the problem is that the people who need to configure those servers that have now been rebuilt from scratch don't have access because one of the first things that was done was the isolation of the VPN to protect the network. And therefore, the very people to help you rebuild the network are currently in their cars driving in from many hours away, as a lot of people have sort of dispersed out to home working locations a long distance away from data centers and from main, main head offices. So now you have this delay of getting your people in to start doing the rebuild in the early stages when you really need people, you know, hands on keyboards. So when I talk to people, I say, you know, really, you need to think about your minimum operating capability, capacity, call it what you want. MOC is what I abbreviate it to. And one of the most important things to do when you're looking at your minimum operating capability is understand how do you actually make money? And I, I, when I'm doing my course, it's one of the first things I turn around to my, uh, my students and say is like, how does your business make money? And not just, the, not just the, the bit that you sell, but how do you go from the advertisement, from the encouragement, from the, you know, the building of the confidence with the customer, to the actual the making of the purchase, to the delivery of the product, and the billing, and the taking of the money? Because that is the whole, how do we make money? It's not, we sell X widgets, or we sell these computers, or we sell this service. There's that whole pipeline that needs to be intact. So when I'm saying to people, if you don't understand how you make money, how do you prioritize your system rebuilds? Okay, if I give you an example, this is a, an Illinois hospital which was impacted back in 2021. In 2023, they finally went into administration because of the ransomware attack two years previous. 
And it wasn't the fact that it impacted a lot of systems, and, and, and well, I mean, it did, but it wasn't the systems that you would have thought it was. It wasn't the systems around the delivery of the healthcare. No, no, no. This was the billing systems around how they would be able to claim back against various insurance organizations the funds for the healthcare that they'd given. Effectively, they chewed through their cash over two years and therefore couldn't continue to operate because they were they cash starved. So understanding how you actually do every part of your business, how you can issue you know, demands to various insurance companies in this case, and actually get that, that payment, et cetera, evidence that the healthcare was given and be able to say, this is, this is our bill, please pay our bill. If you cannot do that, you cannot make money. If you do not make money, you don't stay in business long. So understand what those are. So plan around, once you understand how you, how you make money, what are the systems that are critical to you making that money? Okay, understand what those are. And then turn around and say, well, how many of those do we need? How long does it take to recover? How big are they? Where are they? Where are the backups? How fast is that pipe? All of those things are super important for you to understand how quick it is to actually restore a network. Because if you turn around and say, oh, it's this many servers, for example, you have your application servers, maybe your, a couple of web servers and some of your domain controllers encrypted. And you may turn and say, well, let's just recover these things. But maybe you can't recover these things because your actual domain is offline because of the systems being encrypted. And you try and say, well, let's just get the systems back up and running, but you can't because you need to get the network operational and the storage operational before you can do your first domain controller rebuild. And if you have contaminated attacker access domain controllers, you might need to do a complete flatten and rebuild. For example, if you had, say, 30 domain controllers and the attacker accessed 10 of them okay, and encrypts them and has maybe modified some of those systems, you'll be thinking, oh, well, well, what do I do now? Can I trust all of the accounts that are in that environment? Okay, So you have this whole big timeline type thing that you need to understand, how do I build this? How long does this take? How long will it take me to get a single domain controller operational again? in a trusted and safe environment. Because, for example, if the attackers added or modified or changed part of your, your Active Directory, you may want to do a shutdown of your Active Directory and then do a restoration to a safe copy. That's cool. You had 30 domain controllers, 10 of them were impacted. You have to take the other 20 offline. Then you have to get the clean one back up. Now you've got one. But how many do you need? If you had 30 before, you probably needed at least 15. I'll say 10 at a minimum. How long does it take you to build 10? Because until you get those 10 operational, nobody else can work. If you're using single sign-on throughout your enterprise, nobody else can sign on. Do you have any break glass accounts, accounts that do not require that single sign-on, do not require Active Directory? Because if you don't, then people can't access your SIM to investigate. If you can't investigate, how do you know the attacker's not still on the network? What's the point in doing a rebuild if the attacker may still go in there and start you know, setting more things on fire effectively, encrypting more systems, stealing more credentials? You need to understand what the attacker has done. You're going to need your SIM. To get your SIM, you need your Active Directory. To get your Active Directory, you need your storage, you need your networks. Do you see how all of a sudden we have a, a longer timeline than just rebuild one machine? You need to understand what that is. You need to understand how long it takes, how big are the systems, how big is that pipe, how fast can you restore those virtual machines or those physical machines? And then stack rank those in priority and work out what your minimum operating capability is. And that is your fastest time to get operational. And that could be just enough to be able to communicate with your customers. If you have other ones, you, the next thing after your MOC is gonna be building out all of the services that you need to support your, cri your critical customers, probably the one that make, makes you the most money because then at least you can get a revenue stream to come in whilst you're trying to get the lower, lower profitability services up and running. That's what you need to do. That's a prioritized rebuild mechanism. That is a critical timeline. So what you should do is sit there and try and work out from a standing start, how long would it take us to get to an MOC, to get up to domain controller storage, security teams, networks, website? What is that timeline? How long is that? Okay, and also you think about it, the first point, if you've been offline for a week or two weeks and you put a website back up finally to get some services and you've got two weeks of customer pent up like, is my data safe? If you know, I, I work at a bank, is my money safe? Is it still there? I'm gonna have lots of people, potentially millions of customers all trying to hit you as soon as you come back up. So you need, maybe need to plan not just for regular capacity, but extra capacity so that you don't go, you know, offline for a week, a week and a half, online for an hour and then offline again because you haven't got the capacity. What message does that send to your customers? They'll be like, if we were worried before, we're super worried now.
So think about that. Make sure that at all times when you come back up initially, you have not just normal capacity, but extra capacity. Write all that down in a playbook so that when you're under stress, you know how to do it. People know what to do and they know this is the priority of the recovery of the systems. This is how long it's going to take. Which ones can we extend? Which ones are optional? Okay. And then maybe, you know, see, see if there's any extra, you know, support that we need to put around that. Because if we're going to have admins working around the clock, maybe to do a restoration, then what's the real life support for that? What hotels, what food, what accommodation can we get for them to make sure that they're sustainable and while they're doing this big surge? Can you speed up this timeline? If you added more people, can it can it get faster? Or is it something that's intractable because therefore adding more people just adds more people and more people are sitting around waiting for the network to be ready, waiting for the domain controllers to be ready, okay? So think about that and see if it is possible and if not, then work out exactly what that timeline looks like. Number seven there, look at see, can your insurance help you with this? Do they have any, uh, any tips to help you plan out and do a faster remediation of the extra services that they could help fund to bring in I mean, some other way of doing lift and shift from backups to restored services that might help you go faster, okay? And what do you do with your staff when your network's down? You know, it's like, ooh, yeah, because you've got, maybe if you're, you thought you're gonna be offline for three days, it's gonna be two weeks. What do you do with all your staff for two weeks? Because not everybody's gonna be working. You're gonna send them on holiday? You're gonna have them do things? Charitable things? Things to take their mind off it? It's up to you, but you need a plan because two weeks for a lot of staff is a long time to be doing nothing. Might be you can force them on holiday and say, go take some time off because there's nothing for you to do here. But plan for that and have a way of communicating with them, okay? Because communicating with the staff when the network's down, will if you can't do that, they're gonna be worried. Two weeks without a peep from the boss, you're sat there going, I can't log on, I can't do anything, I see bad things in the press, I would be stressed as a member of staff. Okay, so, and the last one is, how do you practice for this? You know, how do you actually sit there and plan and practice and actually do a full restoration test, a proper red team disaster recovery plan? How do you, you know, take, take some data and go and see if we can rebuild it in a, in a mini data center? Have that, that'd be an amazing exercise to do. Really, really useful. And a really good indicator to let you know how long it takes you to do these things. So there we go. That was talking about the timelines and how you need to understand what your recovery timeline was. If you like that, uh, then we do more of this kind of stuff on LDR 553, which is the Cyber Incident Management course. It's not Incident Response. Incident Response is where we're doing, as I talked about in the previous video, doing the technical stuff, the analysis as to what the attacker's done. We're, we're taking that information from IR and then saying, how do we make this better for the organization? How do we plan the remediation, the recovery, and making sure that we are hardening our systems as we go along? Contact details if you need them. Other than that, I will see you on the next one. Thank you.